Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me warmly welcome uh, all of you uh, who are present at the auditorium in person, as well as that all others that who have joined virtually to the monthly clinical meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and in this month in collaboration with the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensivists in Sri Lanka. As we know that more and more frequently, we all need surgeries for many things, including, including for maternity care and for geriatric age and even for smallest child, infant, or the neonate. Therefore, the surgeries has to be safe for people, and we should be able to ensure safe surgery for all our customers, our customers are patients. So based on that, the intensivists and the anesthetists in Sri Lanka decided to do this presentation today on perioperative care pathways, ensuring patient safety and improved outcomes. We have three speakers line up for this session. Dr. Vihara Dasanayake, Senior Lecturer in Anesthesiology and Honorary Consultant Anesthetist, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, who would be to talking to you on perioperative care and the role of anesthesiologist. And then Dr. Harin Jaguda, consultant anesthetist, District General Hospital Ambilipit here, would be discussing a case. It would be a case-based discussion. And Dr. Ravin Digunaratna, senior registrar in anesthesiology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, uh, would be joining with us for the symposium. Uh, so with that brief introduction, uh, let me invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. Vihara Dasanayake, to uh, make her presentation on perioperative care and the role of anesthesiologist. It would be a review lecture. Vihara, over Thank to you, you, Madam, for that kind introduction. And first and foremost, before I start, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting us, the College of Anesthesiologists, uh, for this monthly clinical meeting. And uh, we've chosen the topic of perioperative medicine and perioperative care because it's become a clinical science which has been of much discussion in the recent past. And I think for us as anesthesiologists, it's perhaps the way forward. And why perioperative care and perioperative care pathways? It's really like, uh, Madam said, it's really to ensure patient safety and good outcomes. Because from the time the patient contemplates surgery up until discharge, the experience that the patient is going to have, the quality of care that he or she is going to have, and their journey throughout the surgery can be modified by a multidisciplinary team. Now, from the inception, I would like to, before I start actually my review lecture, I would like to say that nothing in healthcare is achievable without team effort, which means collaboration. And this includes our multidisciplinary team in a perioperative care pathway, which includes a surgeon, the anesthetist, the intensivist, the physicians, uh, geriatricians, physiotherapists, and nutritionists, and maybe any other related subspeciality. So let me start off with, uh, my lecture. Okay, so just to begin with, first and foremost, I would like to show you what the role and the responsibility of the anesthetist is. Let's go down a little bit down memory lane. The roles and responsibilities of the anesthesiologist, where did it all began? Well, if you look at, this is just one slide, just to uh, reiterate, um, you know, how it all started. Around the 19th and the early 20th century with the advent of um, anesthetic gases and local anesthetics, which preceded intravenous anesthetic agents, administering anesthesia uh, among different sort of countries around the globe was, quite done, was done quite differently. If you look at the United States, anesthesia was administered mostly by the surgeons, the nurses, and medical specialists. 
But if you looked at the United Kingdom around that time, it was mainly physician led. Credit goes to John Snow and that's when it started off there. But you look, if you look at Europe, the model is even different. It's a joint collaboration between anesthetists and non-anesthetists. In the 1940s, with the advent of curare, which is a neuromuscular blocking drug. So in the 1940s, with the advent of curare, which was a neuromuscular blocking drug, of course, the administering of anesthesia shifted to a more specialized person, and that was the anesthetist. The reason being, it required facilitation of endotracheal intubation to ensure safe surgery. Now, just as much as it had good, it also had repercussions, because if you gave a neuromuscular relaxer, a blocking drug to a patient, patient required to be, uh, you have to observe the patient till the patient comes out of the muscle relaxant, and the patient needed to be observed. So what happened next was that the anesthetist was actually forced to study the physiology, the pharmacology, and even bag mask ventilation and manual ventilation. So with this came round about the 1950s, the anesthesia related death rates, which was about one in 1,500. Now this is when they realized that they had to take the responsibility of improving patient safety. Coming to the second half of the 20th century, things moved forward. The anesthetists actually moved out of the operating theater more towards intensive care, pain medicine, and also being a part of emergency medicine team. So this led to what anesthesia so is So what today. is it like today for the anesthesiologists? People live longer. That's great. That's really good news. But with it comes a package. So we've got a lot of elderly patients who's obviously, who's got cognitive impairment, frailty, multiple comorbidities, which means we're dealing with more sicker patients. Patients practice polypharmacy, and there's also increased complexity of surgery. It's not only surgery, the anesthetic and the surgical techniques have increased tremendously. So there's a demanding healthcare system out there. And to make matters worse, 80% of the perioperative complications constitutes to avoidable harm, which refers to if there's an underlying medical problem which has not been assessed, optimized, recognized, we're going to end up with perioperative complications. So this is a huge burden to the existing resources. So this is when there was a shift from an anesthetist to a perioperative physician. Now in the modern era, the anesthetist is involved not only during surgery, but before, after, and they may extend beyond the index admission of surgery. Specialty of anesthesia has obviously built a quality of safety and performance. Way back in the 1950s, where the mortality rates was one in 1,500 has shifted, and we've come a long way, where anesthesia-related mortality has actually become less than one in 100,000. So from a traditional operating theater-based anesthesia, care has been moved forward to perioperative, to being a team member of perioperative care. So what is perioperative medicine and care pathways? It's a pathway for better surgical care. And like I said, it is a multidisciplinary team involvement. But what I'm going to confine myself to is to see how we as anesthesiologists can contribute significantly to this pathway, what we've been doing today, and what we can do further to improve ourselves to ensure that the patients have a better outcome and a quality of life. Now, I extracted this from the RCOA, the Royal College of Anesthetists Perioperative Medicine Bulletin, which actually has one dedicated bulletin for, uh, to ensure what you should be doing as to the pathway of better surgical care. So what happens before surgery? A lot of things happens because this is a journey for the patient who comes to us. The illnesses that they have, if you do not optimize, with the stress of surgery itself, can delay patient recovery. So we must use that golden opportunity, which is actually termed as a teachable moment before we perform surgery to discuss with the patient, to assess what the patient has and to optimize their long-term disease. What happens during surgery? So safe surgery is obviously the greatest success of modern healthcare. The challenges of care during surgery is actually to improve quality of patient care and to prevent medical errors. So the presence of an experienced anesthetist supported by the multidisciplinary team will provide this opportunity for delivery of treatments which need significant medical input. So does it stop there? Not really. 
surgery goes beyond that index admission. So early after surgery, it's true that most of the surgeons are increasingly di diversified in their technical expertise. And the care of acute and long-term medical disease is even more challenging. And how can the anesthetists get involved here? Because it's important that we use our knowledge and skills with recent advances to try and find out the complications and the complex needs and to try and treat these medical problems. But it goes beyond that because patients obviously return home and we want them to return home early, but they, we also want them to have a good quality of life. So this is where the primary and the secondary care services will have to come in. So like I said, back to perioperative medicine and pathways, it's a multidisciplinary care involvement. So by definition, it's an integrated multidisciplinary medical care of patients from the moment of contemplation of surgery until recovery. And multidisciplinary subspecialties is composed of practitioners who will effectively identify the needs, needs of the patient and also be able to identify the patients who are at risk of adverse events. So which requires interventions before, during and after surgery. Again, perioperative medicine is not exclusive to one subspeciality or speciality. But the anesthetist is well positioned to lead this pathway. The reason being the knowledge that they have gained, the experience and the skills together with their colleagues. So what are we aiming for in a perioperative care pathway? To deliver safe and high quality care to patients, to identify and optimize the high risk, to promote decision-making. So decision-making is always patient-centered in today's context. Patients have to be informed and it's choosing wisely what is best for them. Surgery may not always be the best for them, but that comes in this, in this package of perioperative care. Reducing unwarranted variation in practice, reducing the metabolic stress involved with surgery and to lower the incidence of organ-specific complications reducing preventable harm and complications, and eventually improving patient satisfaction, promoting high quality recovery after surgery and improving long-term morbidity and mortality. So this is the care pathway where us as anesthetists can actually chip in. Now this is a busy slide, but if you look at it on your left-hand side, you see the traditional care pathway. And what we are trying to aim is the future. That's on the right-hand side. So if you look at the traditional pathway where we don't have a GP referral system in Sri Lanka, just like it's in the UK, but we do have general practitioners who would probably refer patients to hospitals, to physicians. They come into the hospital clinic, diagnostic tests are done, investigations are carried out. If you think it's a malignancy, staging is done. Patient is referred to the multidisciplinary team and then the patient gets referred to the surgical clinic. It takes a long time. This is from the contemplation of surgery. And the first formal physiological assessment will occur after that, which is the pre-op assessment clinic. And this is where we as anesthetists gets involved and we should. And I think there are most of the, the clinics in Sri Lanka in most of the hospitals is also the pre-op assessment clinics are led by anesthetists. And this would actually help us to risk stratify patients to either be in low risk, medium or high risk. And depending on that, in this, traditional care pathway, we might decide, okay, this patient needs more investigations, needs, you know, certain decisions to be made and probably some more referrals. This is going to take a long, long time. And then comes the surgery. But what has been proposed is the future. And that, if you look at it from the time of contemplation of surgery, the whole package occurs together. The, from the hospital clinic to diagnostic testing to multidisciplinary team, everything goes parallel. So basically, patient evaluation and pathology evaluation goes hand in hand. So you reduce the time that you're going to sort of, you know, get this patient into this care pathway and to discharge them home quickly and safely. So anesthetists get involved in this multidisciplinary team involvement. They get involvement in pre-op pre assessment clinics. And what can they do? They can actually refer them to the appropriate specialist. One of the best examples is anemia clinics where you might refer, most of our patients are actually by definition, a hemoglobin of 13 is what the consensus guideline says for most of our elective patients. And if you look at most of our patients, they are definitely less than that. 
So if you have a hematologist and you have an anemia clinic, you can obviously refer these patients well ahead of time. Similarly, anything to do with cardiac, neurology, or respiratory, renal uh, optimization, this will all be done together from the time of contemplation of surgery. So the time period from the time of contemplating to surgery to surgery and discharge is much shorter. So this is basically um, what the future is going to be like. Now I've extracted this diagram from uh, the journal Anesthesia in 2019, where they have titled it very appropriately, Perioperative Care Pathways, Re-Engineering Care to Achieve the Triple Aim. And the triple aim they're referring to is, if you go for this future perioperative care pathways, you're gonna improve patient satisfaction, you're gonna improve public health, and finally the per capita cost on healthcare and resources. So what is our role? Well, before, during, and after. So before surgery, pre-op assessment, like I highlighted on an outpatient basis, traditionally and historically, most admissions might happen the day before and night before, but we don't have much time for op optimization, assessments, referrals, and therefore it gets delayed, cancellations, increased cost. So this is ideal for a, a low middle income country or resource limited setting like ours. Preoperative or the perioperative period is actually a teachable moment. Why do we say it's a teachable moment? It's been defined in the literature because if you have a patient, for example, smokers, if you want them, if you want the patient to be on a smoking cessation program, you use that period to explain to them. And perhaps if you have any counseling or any, you know, sort of uh, people who'd like to help them overcoming this kind of problem, you refer to them. So there's adequate time for it. So it becomes a teachable moment. And there are these three categories of opportunity for an anesthetist to improve preoperative care. And these three opportunities are collaborative decision-making where patient-centered, but you collaborate with your colleagues to make the decision whether to go for surgery or not, or what options are available and how you would plan their care pathway. Comorbidity management, a lot of risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, anemia, so, you assess and optimize them. But some of these factors we need to appreciate are modifiable and some are not. So the ones which is not is obviously beyond our control, but the ones which are will, will to some extent, well, even if it's acquired, say for example, anemia or a patient has got bad COPD, you still have time for optimization if you see them at the pre-op assessment clinics four to six weeks prior. And collaborative behavioral changes. And that's where things like well, we don't have this over here, but uh, in the West, they have what are called joint schools in orthopedics, where patients are being, you know, they have little discussions, they talk about what the experience had been with uh, fast track surgery or enhanced recovery after surgery following uh, hips and knee uh, joint replacements, and also things like smoking cessation and alcohol cessation. So these three opportunities uh, have to be grabbed by the anesthesiologist, and it is something which we can do because we are well positioned to lead this pathway. And also you risk triage them. And how do you do that? You've got tools, you've got clinical scores and you've got biomarkers. And by doing that, you can identify the high-risk patient who would develop a major adverse event and plan the perioperative period accordingly. Assess and optimize, evaluate. And I said that evaluation of the patient and the pathology should go hand in hand. And we come to this concept of prehabilitation. So prehabilitation is really, if I go back to my original slide, the comorbidity management and the collaborative behavioral change. That is actually behavior, that is what we refer to as prehabilitation. So it's a multimodal process where you're trying to improve uh, the physical and psychological resilience of a patient preoperatively to improve their functional capacity uh, in order to improve post-op outcomes. So it uses this theory called marginal gains where multiple interventions put together brings a good outcome. So what's the outcome here for a patient is reducing morbidity and mortality. This includes uh, many things like structured exercise programs, nutritional optimization, psychological intervention and lifestyle changes. And what we're trying to aim at the end is this green line, the dotted green line. So if you start prehabilitation, you start on a better wicket. Your minimal level of functional ability is much greater, even though it comes down at the time of the surgical procedure because of stress and related factors. 
you pick up really quick. But somebody who is down here is a person who has not had prehabilitation. So it's a joint endeavor undoubtedly with multidisciplinary teams to ensure better outcomes. What is it like for the anesthesiologist during surgery? So obviously management of safety and well-being of patients during anesthesia is the core role of the anesthesiologist. The constant presence of an adequately trained anesthetist is the single most measure for ensuring safety of the anesthetized patient. And the broad clinical expertise and the training they've got to detect signs of organ function deterioration, to monitor and interpret changes and to manage complications, put them quite high on this list to manage these patients effectively during this journey of the patient. And they are familiar with working with multidisciplinary teams. And enhanced recovery after surgery, ERAS has become the norm. It's universal in almost all major surgeries today. So achieving the goals of enhanced recovery after surgery has become one of the significant roles played by the anesthesiologist in today's context. What is it like after surgery? So it's a continuum of care, including post-op management. Identifying and treating acute complications in the immediate post-op period, including in the later post-op phase. So they are undoubtedly a valuable asset and a team member in the post-op care team. Again, due to the competence in diagnosing and treating acute changes in organ function. So this continuous care just doesn't stop there. It might be in a medium care environment or it may be in an intensive care unit. The anesthesiologist can also get involved in identifying the failure to rescue patients. What does that mean? It's found that about 7% of post-surgical patients would develop at least one surgical complication. So FTR or failure to rescue is perioperative mortality related to delayed diagnosis and treatment of either a surgical or a non-surgical complication. So how is the anesthetist involved here? Again, they can involve, get involved in remote site monitoring like in outreach services and to identify the high-risk patient. Now this is supported by this one and only study which is still ongoing in the Netherlands. This was the first study actually uh, that looked at the effects of routine post-op visit by an anesthetic provider on mortality and cost effectiveness of surgical patients. We're yet to see the outcomes, but the hypothesis that they have made is that the anesthesiologist who's highly trained in the monitoring and treatment of deteriorations in vital parameters could be of added value regarding the early diagnosis of post-op complications. So this is the routine post-surgical anesthesia visit to improve patient outcome. Um, it's still ongoing and the results will be out soon. The anesthetist also plays a role in pain medicine. So acute pain services was introduced under the supervision of the anesthetist. And today there are some anesthetists who have dedicated themselves not only to acute, but even to chronic pain services. By implementing such a pain service, obviously improves pain treatment, decrease allergies and related side effects, and improve patient satisfaction and overall quality of life. And acute pain services is undoubtedly a quality indicator of multidisciplinary acute pain care. Now, up to this point, what I spoke about is a patient who's coming for a routine elective surgery, but the anesthetist gets involved in an emergency setting, not only as a part or a member of the emergency team, but the best example I can give is somebody coming with interstinal obstruction. So there are rescue pathways, which are simple, but they do focus on certain things, early diagnosis and surgery, resuscitation and optimization within a limited time frame, And that's where the anesthetist gets involved. It's consultant-led, goal-directed therapy, which is norm in enhanced recovery after surgery, whether it be elective or emergency, and intensive or intermediate post-op care for high-risk patients. What's the final aim? To reduce or attenuate the perioperative stress and pain management, to improve that and to facilitate early recovery. There are roles beyond the boundaries of an operating theater, but they will always carry the same standards of monitoring and same standard of care. So 
Anesthesia is also provided, we know, outside the operating theater for invasive non-surgical interventions. As some of the examples, as you all know, would be procedural sedation for endoscopy or maybe for some radiological imaging, maybe in the catheterized, the cath lab or the cath for catheterization where you may anticipate a difficult airway or where resuscitation may be anticipated. Most of the cardiopulmonary resuscitation training globally is spearheaded by the anesthetist. And active participation in academic and scholarly pursuits comes under this because if we are to fulfill our obligations to our patients, this becomes an important point. And conduct training for juniors and related specialities, both in anesthesia and related specialities, and to provide leadership in areas of patient safety and quality of care. Before I conclude, I would like to uh, show two or three slides on this, which is recommended reading for all anesthetists in the audience, COVID-19 and the anesthetists, a special series which was issued in November 2020, 2020 in the British Journal of Anesthesia. If I'm to summarize some of the key things which has been stated there, what was it like? What was the contribution by the anesthesiologist as a perioperative physician during the pandemic? Just as much as they were manning the intensive care units with their colleague intensivists, they were redeployed from operating theaters to manage makeshift ICUs. So they were the most experienced in the management of airways. And we know that intubation is considered an aerosol generating procedure. And as a result, they were exposed to a lot of viral transmission. They were also involved during this pandemic in inter and intra-hospital transfer of the critically ill. And they also assisted their colleagues in wards through outreach services and remote vital sign monitoring. So it was no surprise, and we should be pleased about it, when the issue of Time Magazine in April 2020, for the first time, their cover page featured an anesthetist. And this was titled, The Special Report, Heroes of the Frontline. So in conclusion, changes and developments in the role of the anesthetist is an example of how the speciality has responded and adapted to new challenges in healthcare. The anesthesiology plays a key role in the perioperative care pathway in individual risk assessment, medical optimization, getting themselves involved in enhanced recovery after surgery, individualized pain management during the perioperative period. Perioperative medicine and care pathways provides a foundation for the consistent delivery of safe and good quality care to surgical patients. And as the saying goes, Surgeons treat diseases and anesthetists saves life. We must not forget that behind every successful operation lies a joint effort of a surgeon and anesthetist and the multidisciplinary care team. Like I said, as much as we should be pleased about what we've been doing, we've got a lot more to do. And if I'm to quote from the British Journal of Anesthesia, finally, I quote, we must reflect on our specialities journey and develop strategies for our future development, unquote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome all of you for this session. So me and Ravindi that we are going to start this as a perioperative care. So our role as anesthetist. So we are going to have a case discussion. So I'm with Ravindi. Right, okay, this is a true case that we encountered actually. This is a true case actually we encountered. So uh, this is 75 year old lady who is admitted to District General Hospital in our hospital. She's complaining of uh, generalized acute abdominal pain with weakness of the body and reduced intake for last couple of days actually. On admission, it was very vague actually. She's with confusion and there was a headache and query slurring of speech. Her past medical history revealed that it's she had an anterior STEMI with uh, in 2020 with in February with ejection fraction of 30 percent at that presentation, according to the echo. And she is a diagnosed patient with anemia as well as she's a hypertensive patient. So she was on dual platelets, antiplatelets, aspirin and cropterol, and she was on atorvastatin and antihypertensives as well. So on, exam on examination, she was afreply and she's still looking. She was quite confused with the GCS 15. So the examination has led to see the neck stiffness and her limbs because the presentation, she was confused and she's with slurring of speech as well. Blood pressure was marginal and she's tachy tachycardic. She's tachypnic as well with maintaining saturation around 95% with face mask. 
the lungs were with some cramps. Abdomen was tender, distended, and reduced power sounds as well. Uh, dual ex uh, digital examination of rectum was done, which was not significant. So the Q so far was uh, applied on her where the hat has become positive. Whereas she was uh, altered conscious level and she's tachypneic, though she's blood pressure is maintaining the marginal cutoff level, even though she is a hypertensive patient. So we did the investigations, which that she is uh, WBC has gone up. She's quite anemic. So with the chronic anemia history of her, platelet was maintaining, CRP has gone up. At the same time, the coagulation was some derangement with some electrolyte imbalances. Creatinine was hitting on the upper range and beyond the upper range where she is acute kidney injury was diagnosed. We did a chest X-ray in the ward stay. So the chest X-ray reveals as right. such. So chest X-ray reveals as that where is X-ray, which was inconclusive, where it's like like this sort of uh, tissue plane uh, separation. The surgeons was quite uh, because of the admission as acute abdomen and this sort of uh, chest X-ray. So we decided. So we had a echo done on her. Uh, sorry, ultrasound scan abdomen done on her, which said increased cortical uh, echogenicity whereas some sort of a mass kind of appearance that they have noted. Therefore, they have to go for the CT, which we have to do for the non-contrast CT abdomen because she's with acute kidney injury where the creatinine was hitting on the upper range and beyond the upper range. So we did the non-contrast CT. With the non-contrast, there is some air pockets, which was gases noted in sub-diaphragmatic uh, level, as well as some paracolic gutter the, uh, the gases was noted, as well as some mass lesion was found to be in the left side uh, uh, posterior to the stomach. So uh, the, the decision by the consultant radiologist was given is as that's most likely that patient is having hollow viscous perforation. So it's a joint decision we made that the patient needs a surgery. So we did the CT brain actually, which is normal. It's because her presentation was uh, slurring of speech and confusion as she was on uh, antiplatelets, dual platelets. So thinking of ischemia as well as hemorrhage. So we had to go for a CT, which was normal actually. And we did the blood gas. So this is her blood gas values where she's with the acidosis. And uh, the lactate was sitting on the marginal range, but she's maintaining oxygen, but she was washing out the carbon dioxide. She had quite negative base excess with a ranging of minus 13. So preoperatively, we have to prepare the patient. So we have identified, so the risk assessment, so we have to identify her risk. So we have to optimize the patient before she's going for the surgery. And then we have to prepare the patient for before she's going for the surgery. Same time, we have to plan her intraoperative as well as postoperative care too. So there were quite a lot of challenges that we faced. This is an elderly lady who's coming for a surgery. So she is a high risk, obviously, that you can see. She's uh, the AC4 grade uh, lady with a limited time frame, which was available for us to optimize her. Preoperative resuscitation, which was, we had a very little time period where it's emergency surgery. So we, the decision was to do, so we have to limit a time period to do. At the same time, she is with sepsis, whereas she has a dysregulated host response to infection uh, resulting life-threatening event. So she carries a high risk of mortality as well as morbidity. She's with a many of the medical issues. So she has multiple medical issues which going for a surgery. As you know, she's on antiplatelets. So she with uh, deranged coagulation. So we have to uh, be anticipated the risk of bleeding. So uh, the intraoperative blood transfusion was high. So physical and physiological preparation and the relatives were very, very challenging actually because the, this lady was confused and we were not able to counsel her. We were not able to tell or educate the things on her. However, we were able to counsel the lady, the next of kin, the relatives of the patient, and we have to proceed with the surgery. As you know, the, every surgical procedure involves that has a significant, some sort of a risk where 
with the post-operative as well, but in a case of emergency, this risk is high. So uh, high-risk surgical patients, where is reduction of the risk, so we have to give the optimal care intraoperative as well as preoperative day. So operative mortality is significant in express the terms of death occurring during the surgery up to 10 days after surgery after such patient. So this is the, the surgery, emergency surgeries that they have categorized according to the uh, emergency where the surgical procedures, what they're going to do depending on the admission. So the, it's mainly this sort of uh, surgical procedures and these are the indications that the surgeries that are leading to. Right. So this is a patient that is going for a theater immediately or urgently. So what is our role as anesthetist during the surgery? So the preoperative care, we start, it begins with actually when the surgeon's decision on taking to the theater on their opening of the surgery. And so it's our, the preoperative part is from their decisions to patient is going on to sleep in the operating theater. So preoperative resuscitation is a challenge for us. So we have to admit this lady to our ICU for pre-op resuscitation in her. There was limited time period, as I said, was available for us to proceed with. So we have to have the intensive monitoring in her where the arterial lines and invasive blood pressure monitoring, central line monitoring, as such invasive monitoring, we have to establish on this lady. So this hemodynamics has to stabilize with the fluids, blood, as you can remember, it's HP was around six that we have to give some blood before she's going for the surgery uh, and have to stabilize her and the electrolytes has to be uh, optimized before the surgery. So that's why we have to have uh, invasive things to be done. As well as we involve the multidisciplinary approach in this lady, where we had, uh, so uh, this lady actually what we did, so her airway, though she's confused and her GCS is 15, she's maintaining airway. So we administered her with oxygen with 15 liters per minute with face mask. And we monitored her saturation. She was nursed with 30 degree proper position and nebulizations which commenced with more frequent normal saline nebulizations and as well as the physiotherapy quite frequently. So the circulation wise, the monitoring was established. As I said, arterial lines is placed to have a beat to beat blood pressure monitoring and frequent blood gases to be done. And she was assessed with her fluid status, with the focused incentive care echo, with collapsibility of the IVC. We were not able to do the passive leg raising at this time because she's with the acute tummy, the abdominal pain. So we was not do, able to do the passive leg raise to assess her fluid status. Therefore, we went with the fist as well as the IVC collapsibility. So the sepsis care bundle, of course, we implemented within admission to the ICU as well as before. So the antibiotics, time, uh, the uh, timely antibiotics was given as broad spectrum antibiotics, as well as we have to take the cultures was sent for the uh, sensitivity. So the fluid resuscitation with the crystalloids was initiated. As her HP low, we transfused some blood. We asked to preserve FFP at platelets because she's coagulation was deranged as well as she's on the dual platelets where the, which carries high risk bleeding during the surgery. So internal jugular vein, right-sided uh, central venous catheter was uh, initiated and we have to start noradrenaline because she has gone into stage of septic shock where with adequate fluid resuscitation, even though she is having quite high potency to maintain the MAP more than 65, where, where which was our target. So that's why we have to administer noratrolene starting with. We thought of going this in uh, internal jugular vein in the right femoral, it's because we thought that uh, the subclavian is out because her coagulation is deranged, as well as we thought that she might be, because we thought that this is a perito, the abdominal viscous injury, it can be bowel perforation. So anyhow, she might be needing parental nutrition. So that's why we went for a internal jugular rather than femoral and the preserving one line for, if any case that we are needing parental nutrition. So we had to repeat the blood gases and assess her lactate levels 
where, the, where, where we were in resuscitation process. So uh, as I told, she's confused and GCS flow so that she, we were not able to have a good capacity on her eliminating on her. So it was quite difficult to consent her from her to the surgery. However, we were able to get it from the relatives after counseling, after giving educating them. So we had the expert opinion for the optimization, our lady, our patient. So the cardiology assessment of the pharmacological review, as well as the cardiac function assessment. In that case, the repeat echo says it's 25 to 30, quite high risk patient going for a surgery with epical hypokinesia with severe left ventricular dysfunction. So this is uh, the recommendations to Amit Kapitagil. Uh, the risk, weighing the risk and the benefits. So asked to continue the aspirin and to have some target hemoglobin level. And the, they have classified this is as a high risk patient going for a surgery, non-cardiac surgery. However, so we had obtained expert opinion in microbiology biology point of view. So we, we started meropenem, as I said, the broad spectrum antibiotic at the initial state. So they asked to continue the meropenem until the cover until the reports are available, the culture reports, but we have to give it the renal dose because on admission, she was born into AKI. So we have to give the renal doses, the renal friendly doses of the meropenem as well. So the explaining risk from the relatives and we have to, we, uh, the risk classification was done with the PPOSM where she carries the high risk of mortality as well as morbidity. Right, so this is what we did in our patient. Are there anything left behind for us to do? Ravindi, what do you think? So uh, there are many strategies that have been discussed and when implemented together have been proven to have improved perioperative outcomes. So in optimization, timely antibiotics, appropriate fluid and electrolyte replacements, and the management of medications that are going on in the patient chronically, the nutritional optimization, the glycemic control if the patient is diabetic, and streamlining admission and diagnosing care pathways, mainly protocolizing them and individualizing according to the patient requirements and early identification of the high-risk patients and consultant-led care. These uh, strategies have improved outcomes for our patients perioperatively. So we'll go through them one by one. So timely antibiotics. This is a proven strategy to reduce mortality in septic patients. Every hour's delay leads to a 7.5% rise in mortality of our septic patients. So this is incorporated into our one-hour bundle. Therefore, we, uh, patients with sepsis should receive antibiotics as a matter of urgency following obtaining of cultures. Uh, the antibiotics should be appropriate for the suspected cause of sepsis, and then uh, they should be of broad spectrum. I think, and, uh, I think this patient now, we have given antibiotics within one hour because uh, the golden hour, the, according to sepsis, but if it is not septic patient, that uh, you can give her within uh, two hours of the surgery, before the two hours of the surgery. So rational approach to fluid resuscitation and electrolyte balance, we'll discuss further regarding this issue, especially during the intraoperative phase. And uh, so optimizing medications, it should be individualized for the patient. So nephrotoxic medications, if the patient is on, we have to omit them, especially we know now this patient, for an example, was on anilopril. So this can give rise to hyperkalemia and impaired renal perfusion. So we might have to omit that and uh, avoidance of NSAIDs and other nephrotoxic agencies of paramount importance. And antihypertensives, we have to optimize the antihypertensives. This patient was hypotensive. So in hypotensive patients, we cannot continue drugs, antihypertensive especially. So uh, then the beta blockers. So beta blockers, we know according to the POIS. Now, if the patient has been on beta blockers for more than two weeks, it is advocated that the patient would be benefited by the continuation of beta blockers during the perioperative period, provided that the patient is not hypotensive or bradycardic. So whenever possible, following surgery, we have to bear in mind that we have to restart these drugs because they have a mortality benefit in especially cardiac failure patients. So the first would be maybe we might have to start the uh, 
calcium channel blockers, restarting of calcium channel blockers, then beta blockers. Slowly, we have to add and optimize our patient. So anticoagulants and antiplatelets, she described well why we had to uh, omit the clopidogrel, but the aspirin was on board, which was really good, so that there are uh, clotting complications. The EF was 30, so that could be prevented by having aspirin on board. That is recommended at the moment. So... And then we can move on to the nutritional optimization. Had this patient been an elective patient, uh, there is a lot of place in optimization of nutrition. But uh, as it is now, the patient is an uh, emergency patient. So there is not much time for uh, nutritional optimization. But we should think of the nutrition. We should place an NG tube like ERAS pathways encourage early starting of enteral nutrition post-op during the post-op period as soon as possible. So maybe we should place an NG tube, plan with the nutritional team when to start and then discuss with the surgeons. Like, so if we cannot start enteral nutrition, we might have to start on parietal nutrition. So they have thought about it, they've inserted their central line and then they have had a dedicated lumen preserved for starting of parenteral therapy, which is suitable for the patient. Uh, so we might have to prevent the refeeding syndrome. So a gradual start and then progression onto the full feed should be recommended. And uh, the glycemic control. So the glycemic control could, could go haywire in this sort of patient because there are associated periods of fasting. And on top of that, she's a diabetic patient. There are stressors associated with this immediate perioperative period. So with all of these hormonal fluctuations, there can be impairments of glycemic control. So our target should be to maintain it between 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. And that is six to 10 millimoles per liter and accepting values of less than 12 millimoles per liter also. So as and when it is necessary, we should be mindful to add a variable rate insulin infusion or to add a dextrose infusion to our therapy depending on the patient's glycemic control. So that means the patients are supposed not to have hyper or not to have hypo during the surgery, even perioperatively, the pre-op, even post-operatively. So that has to be implemented because that's very important when we are treating the patients with a such, such septic patients uh, with uh, glycemic control. Especially hyperglycemia impairs exactly. your immunity yeah. further. So, and then uh, preoperative physiotherapy and education also plays a major role. Might not be so in this emergency laparotomy patient because she is impaired consciousness. GCS was thirteen, but usually if we can educate the patients regarding the what they are to expect regarding the perioperative period, the invasive procedures that they are going to undergo, the ICU stay, all of that, and then what they are supposed to do after the surgery, like deep breathing, coughing, and then use so how to use this spirometry, the importance of DVT prophylaxis, and then. Uh, uh, the positional changes, how they have to comply to physiotherapy for a good outcome. And then all of these things we can tell the patients pre-op and that will reduce their anxiety and therefore will improve their outcome. Yes, I think, I think Ravindi, now if we can implement them, if we can educate them, if we can aware what we are going to do, so that the cooperation that we get from them is very, very good. So in the preoperative stabilization, preoperative resuscitation as perioperative and uh, the physicians as anesthetists, so it will be very easy for us pre-op, intra-op, as well as post-operatively to cooperate with them, to handle with them. So that will be prevent the unnecessary problem, isn't it? Yes. Unnecessary, they won't be pulling up the NG tube. Unnecessary, they won't be pulling up the uh, central lines. A unnecessary, lot of they, anxiety can yes, be Yes, exactly. They will do the, uh, the post of physiotherapy with nicely, with very, I mean, very smooth, smooth. men. Yes, exactly. A smooth pre perioperative course can be ensured by this preoperative physiotherapy and education. And we can incorporate their family members also into this Definitely. scenario so that they'll understand the situation better. So... Preoperative risk assessment and scoring systems. Uh, these are very important, not just for us, but for the patient also. So for us, it will tell us what the risk of the patient is. So depending on that risk, we can uh, modify our care pathways. We can guide our fluid therapy, and then we can decide where the patient is going to be post-op. So what are we going to do to optimize this patient? So that tells us something. And then on from the patient side, we can it can be used to uh, shared decision making. We can tell them that you're going to have this sort of a risk post op and uh, perioperatively. So, uh, their consenting procedure is going to be more informed that way. And the risk assessment uh, helps you to have the multidisciplinary involvement, involvement. In, in so, the whole, 
whole uh, people talking this. in the same terms like when we tell that the pachirisk is this when we tell that the piposum is this the person who is listening on the other side is going to understand what sort of a patient we are talking about yeah. so the patient won't be understand what is piposum or the what is a pachir but we can matches. tell them that gives us idea about what is uh, the risk the amount of risk that the patient is having that we are dealing with actually so the piposum is another score uh, actually it's a uh, score that is commonly used uh, for risk assessment. So it has physiological parameters, 10 physiological parameters and operative parameters, seven. So altogether there are 17 parameters that can be used to assess the uh, operative severity. So the right intervention, the right time, the right place and the right people are of paramount importance in getting the patient optimized and undergoing a smooth perioperative pathway. So the consultant-led care should be there throughout, uh, especially as recommended by Nella, so that uh, if the patient's mortality risk is more than 5%, so the consultants should be involved, the anesthetist, the surgeon, the radiologist, all should be involved. Right? So the consultant from other specialties when appropriate, so the right operation, that's why we have to get the CT reported so that we know we are doing the right thing for the patient at the right time. Uh, the patient should arrive at right appropriate time scale. So, and performed by the right people, the consultant anesthetist and the consultant surgeon should be there. And we should always, always think whether the right facilities are available with us for this sort of patient to be handled. If it's not, it might as well be uh, wise to hand over the patient, the resuscitated patient to a place where the facilities are available. So we should be mindful of these things whenever we are handling these sort of high risk emergency patients. So informed consent, shared decision-making and information to the family. Again, we discussed about these things. So uh, all patients might with capacity to provide full informed consent should be allowed to do so. But the emotional state, the level of understanding of the surgical procedure, their conscious state might be different. So, and their coping strategies, we have to facilitate them to cope this sort of uh, tragical events, so, right? And the support systems we have to introduce so that uh, the perioperative care is complete. So just to go through the NELA, the National Emergency Laboratory Audit. So this is a set of interventions that has been brought together and which has led to a reduction in mortality among the emergency laboratory patients because before this was implemented, even in UK, it was about 14%. Now it has come down to about 9% with the implementation of NELA. So this has several important sets, like CT scan reported by the radiologist before surgery and the risk of death documented preoperatively so that we have, we know it, we are aware of it and then arrival of theater within appropriate time scale. And then this uh, perioperative risk stratification and then appropriate choosing of place to choose the uh, post-operative care. Like if it's more than 10% mortality, they should end up in ICU post-op. So assessment by a, Geriatric specialist if the patients are more than 70 years or so but this hardly happens in our setup because yeah but this is a project or this is an audit that uh, gives us a that's a guide guidance for us where to go and what to do for to identify the high risk patient so and where, where we are to land it we can adopt whatever the steps that we can so that our patient's outcome would be better Right, coming into our patient back. So interoperative, what we did. So here our patient. So we have, to, sorry. So we have to take her, the resuscitated patient that we have to take her into the theater. So after coming into the theater, we re, uh, reassessed her stability, mainly the hemodynamic stability on her. So the monitoring as established in the theater setup. So we have to check the lines, infusions, fluid, uh, the noradrenal infusions, everything we have to recheck before we induce the patient. So we did the surgical checklist on this our patient. So all the time we kept our lady in the proper position because that will be uh, benefited uh, to the patients as well as because pre-oxygen will be there easy, the functional residual capacity will be enhanced so that will be good optimum care would, would have been given. So she's with the NG which was inserted by the surgical team. So we suck, the suction was done on the NG before induction. So as we do as anesthetists, pre-oxygenation was implemented and we intubated in her with a rapid sequence induction.
So our induction agents that we used fentanyl, propofol, and saxamethonium. So it is ideal if we have a short-acting uh, opioid. So it's a, a fentanyl would be fine, but unfortunately, we don't have the fentanyl in our setup. So in that case, we would have think about remifentanil. Unfortunately, we are from the peripheral unit, so we don't have the remifentanil. So we have to go with the fentanyl. So fentanyl with propofol and the saxamethonium. Even if we have the recuronium, that's brilliant, excellent. But unfortunately, we don't have the recuronium with the availability of this uh, reversing drug, the sucramidase. So by knowing these uh, hazards of the saxamethonium, we have to intubate her with the saxamethonium. Right, so what we did in her maintenance, so we, uh, the ventilation which we carried out with according to this uh, protective lung ventilation, as you know that our patient is already sepsis patient where she is with the, 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 the probability of going into ARDS with a septic patient. So we, the tidal volumes that we encountered is very low and the PIP, the optimum inflation pressures we uh, reduced up to 30 and the PEEP that we have given the optimum pressure. So we maintain with the oxygen, isofluorine and uh, medical air. We avoid nitrous oxide in this lady. So uh, we have get, taken measures for the IV fluid therapy during her laparotomy period. So we measured her heart rate, ECG, as well as uh, the serum lactate levels was with the base excess was frequently measured on her to assess her base excess and the lactate level to guide her, us for her microcirculation as well as tissue perfusion, which was guided us by this lactate level. Urine output actually we measured in hourly. So there is a risk, as you know, the, there can be a myocardial depression at the induction with the induction agents. So the risk of hypertension at the time of induction. So, uh, uh, so it's with the central catheter and the noradrenaline has already implemented. So with the noradrenaline, uh, we were able to maintain the MAP more than 65. Otherwise, if you don't have noradrenaline, I think Irandi, we would have had the, either metrominol or phenylephrine, which can be given with the peripheral line as a peripheral vasopressor. So as our lady with the noradrenaline, we continued and we were able to maintain her without any hypotension. Right, so the drugs. So we have given the drugs about multimodal antiemetics, so the, uh, the analgesics, we continued with the morphine, the neuromuscular blocker, that curium, we continued, and the antibiotics, as meropenem, we given quite reasonable time, so we didn't repeat any, any of the antibiotics again. Um, in hypothermia is a problem during the intraoperative, even though the country is like Sri Lanka, the quite nice temperature, but in the theater setup, the hypothermia is uh, some, uh, it should be a preventable thing. So bear hugger and the fluid warmers was established. DVT prophylaxis, of course, even though we don't think about much, DVT prophylaxis have to take in action, even though the patient is with the coagulation during. So the stockings and the <coughs> calf uh, compression device was implemented on her. So those are the standards, actually monitoring standards that we have to implement it as intraoperative period. So the either NIBP, non-invasive blood pressure, it is nice, such a AC4, the high-risk patient going for emergency laparotomy, if we can have a uh, in, uh, invasive blood pressure monitoring with arterial line. And the pulse oximeter to measure the saturation. Capnogram, of course, that gives a quite good information for us during the operative period. So we measure the inspired, expired oxygen levels, carbon dioxide levels, as well as uh, the anesthetic wave analysis. Nitrous levels, we didn't use nitrous oxide, so we use the medical gas. Airway pressures, of course, we measure because there can be a high airway pressure which carries a risk of barotrauma during intraoperative period. Temperature, this uh, recommended that you can have, if it is more than 30 minutes surgery, you have to have the tympanic membrane pressure, uh, uh, tympanic membrane temperature monitoring, but we don't have the facility. So we put the probe the probe to, uh, from the uh, one of the nearest. So then with an esophageal uh, temperature was monitored on her. So the, it's good if you have the nerve stimulator, peripheral nerve stimulator to measure the neuromuscular blocker action, but we, do, we, we, didn't, we don't have the facility. So we went on giving the uh, paralysis as it is required. So this is our patient's findings actually. Shows she's with a perinephric pus tracking anteriorly into the abdominal verse, which full of around one liter of pus, which was drained 
during the operation, the, during the laparotomy. So we took the samples and we sent for the culture and the surgeons thoroughly washed the abdomen with the saline and they have put the, uh, the drain and came out. So it was around, uh, around one hour surgery that was last. So this is what is called damage control laparotomy. It's the, it's not you are not going to do the, the anatomical correction. It's not you are going to explorations, even though it's exploratory laparotomy. So it's for you to quite establish the physiology of the patient. So to do the basic physiology establishment and come out as soon as possible. So that's why they have uh, given the phases in damage control surgery. As you see, the preoperative emergency department, as in our patient in the ward, as well as in ICU, we did the resuscitation and uh, the prevention, the optimization of her during the resuscitation period. In the operating theater, the damage control laparotomy was done and washed out her contamination and came out. If it is a trauma, actually, so it's a lap, uh, damage control laparotomy that the, only the control of the control of bleeding is done. There is no definitive surgery that you are supposed to do. Then patient is going into critical care unit for the further resuscitation and thereafter that you are going for the definitive surgery. Right. So we did the as such. So what do you think intraoperative? Are there anything that we would have done? Uh, so the techniques of undergoing an emergency laparotomy for this sort of patient are to, uh, we should have rapid onset anesthesia, good neuromuscular blockage so that we have a smooth intubating conditions. But uh, we have to be mindful that the hemodynamic stability has to be maintained. So bearing both of these things in mind, like what they did. So what we have to do is we have to good, get the good neuromuscular blocker. Rocuronium would have been ideal looking at the side effects of saxamethonium, but as we don't have the uh, freely available rocuronium with the reversal agent, we have to go ahead with saxamethonium. And then uh, regarding the induction agents, we have to use uh, low, low calculated doses along with higher doses of opioids, short acting opioids, especially uh, as recommended to prevent hypotension during induction. And uh, ideally like what they did, if there is a vasopressor on board, that will be helpful to prevent occurrence of hypotension during induction. So had the patient uh, was free of, had the patient been free of ischemic heart disease, we could have used a bit of ketamine for induction because that helps to maintain the blood pressures. But as this patient was having ischemic heart disease with EF of 30, we cannot use ketamine. So as we have discussed, there are dangerous side effects of uh, saxamethonium, which we have to think about. And then uh, whatever the drug that we are using on a high risk patient, it has to be familiar. We have to be really familiar with uh, all of these drugs that we are using. So using a drug for the first time in a high risk patient might not be advocated. So uh, maintenance of anesthesia, what can we use for maintenance? It could be volatile or uh, so those are the two options we have regarding the volatiles. If we have, say, sevoflurane, that would have been ideal because of the hemodynamic stability that it can achieve and the rapid emergence. But uh, we are a low resource country, so it would be reserved for my uh, our emergency airway surgeries also. And then uh, regarding the TIVA, the TIVA pumps might not be freely available in all of the areas in the country. And then TIVAs are not really programmed for low ejection fraction sort of patients. There are large boluses of propofol that would be going on. So we have to be mindful if you're using a TIVA, but rapid emergence would be an advantage. Right? So yeah. regarding- shall, shall I try to put Ravidi? Now, the thing is now this patient, we would have gone for the TIVA actually, but unfortunately we don't have the uh, target control infusion pump, TCI pump, we don't have the TCI pump. The other thing is we don't have the remifentanil as well. So if it is, we have to go with the fentanyl. I think you agree with me, Dr. Vihara. So we have to go with the remifentanil. That would be a nice with the propofol with the, if you are going for the TIVA. So unfortunately, we didn't have the remifentanil. So that's why, I mean, we are familiar with isoflurane. That's what we do day to day. So the whole last few years, that's what we did. So that's uh, the, with the maintaining of the stability. We thought of it's, it's nicer going to be the isoflurane. The other thing is, if you're going for a TIVA, we have to have a risk monitoring actually. So uh, the gas analysis with the, we have to, uh, the gas analyzers uh, was there. So we, the gas analysis was done. If you are going for a TIVA, then you have to have the this monitoring of the patient. So with the availability of what we have, I think this yes. must have been the best choice at that time. And then 
uh, regarding the intubation, a video laryngoscope would have been ideal. But so, we don't have. Yeah, there is no so video laryngoscope. So we have to go for so the, the good old laryngoscope. Regular yes, laryngoscope, yes. And then uh, management of fluids and hemodynamic support. Fluid management, as always it is, there are three big questions. So when to give, what to give, and how much to give. So these are the three big questions of fluid management. And it is forever a changing topic, a very dynamic one. So uh, there are two phases in this sort of emergency patients, the resuscitative phase and a maintenance phase. So for this resuscitative phase, again, uh, we have already completed that in our pre-op period. So there is not much of a benefit of using crystalloids versus colloids. There is a volume, we can achieve a volume reduction of about one to 1.6 compared, but that has not translated into any clinical benefits. So we can might as well use a balanced crystalloid for resuscitation. Uh, the normal saline has been compared to other crystalloids, the balanced crystalloids. Uh, in studies, but it has uh, been found that the normal saline gives rise to a higher risk of acute kidney injury plus uh, need of uh, renal replacement therapy. So if we, it will be nice if we can use Hartman's for resuscitative purposes and for maintenance purposes in this sort so of- you mean situation. that we can't give colloids in this case? You, you, you're telling that we did right, right? We only give yeah. the crystalloids, we can't give the colloids. Can give colloids in phases where they need blood okay. and uh, blood product therapy to correct the coagulation. Like a trauma patient is yes. coming with hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, they can exactly. be resuscitated with colloids. So rather in these sort of patients, crystalloids could be recommended with blood or blood products whenever necessary. So. Uh, that is regarding resuscitation and the maintenance would be intraoperatively a crystalloid of 1 to 1.5 ml per kg per hour. And then when to give is a big question. And so uh, it's not a routinely given thing. So we have to assess the patient clinically as well as hemodynamically. So the regular hemodynamic parameters have a lot of other confounding factors. So what we have to assess, if we have a minimally invasive a cardiac output monitor, that would be ideal, I say. I mean, we can look at the stroke volume variation, the pulse pressure variation, and then all sorts of uh, stroke volume increments and whether the patient is on the sending limb of his frank starling curve. All of these things could be nicely assessed and the uh, required fluids can be given. But apart from that, we can use the uh, IVC collapsibility or distensibility depending on whether the patient is mechanically ventilated. And uh, again, without a drop of fluid, we can do a passive leg raise and assess whether the patient is fluid responsive. So just the patient being a fluid responsive, do they need fluid? No, they do not need fluid sometimes. If they're maintaining the output, if they're maintaining their map, if they're not on vasopressors, they might not need fluid. We don't have to uh, give uh, overseas fluid resuscitation to these patients. We can look at the biochemical parameters such as lactate or base excess also, but we have to bear in mind that they also have a lot of other contributory factors for their increments or decrements. So those things have to be borne in mind, but uh, we can, come to conclusions on how much of fluids to give. And then in these sort of high risk patients, minimum small volume fluid boluses such as 100 ml are recommended at the moment. And then intraoperatively, especially what they recommend is uh, for high risk patient undergoing high risk surgery, it is recommended that they have Google directed fluid therapy. Google directed, I think we can uh, discuss, right? Yeah. Uh, so despite uh, not having been translated into any uh, much of a mortality benefit. Mm -hmm. It is said that the patient's high-risk ones undergoing high-risk surgery, that it is yeah. better that so they have... So you are saying the goal director, that individualized space... Individualized space. Otherwise, therapy. it will be problems with uh, over-enthusiastic uh, over fluid, fluid resuscitation, resuscitation or under-resuscitated under fluid so. resuscitation, which can be problems like so, this, right? Adequate, not excessive, not too little. So too risk too little will, they will result in hypovolemia, inadequate tissue perfusion, metabolic acidosis or organ dysfunction. So too much, again, tissue edema, anastomotic breakdowns, impaired oxygenation, lungs and pulmonary edema, all of these things. We yeah, have that to. means in the intraoperative period, we can't be too, uh, too, too enthusiastic, enthusiastic yes. and we can't be too lethargic actually. Lethargic so that's also. our role as anesthetists in perioperative medicine, perioperative physicians, that we have to look after the individual base and the giving on fluids. It is targeted a zero balance during the intraoperative period nowadays. So we replace the losses with appropriate fluids and then we give the maintenance. So we target a zero balance during the intraoperative period. Any studies? Period. Any studies would they so, have done? Uh, so regarding the goal directed fluid therapy, uh, so despite having not been translated into any clinical benefits, still there are 
uh, undergoing, doing further research on high risk patients also, that is Floella. So Floella is still under going on, which will be out in 2022 with the results of uh, emergency laparotomy patients having gold directed fluid therapy intraoperatively. So in so, 2022, that we know that is a gold directed is good or better, better rather than this uh, comparatively, the, uh, comparatively rather than the traditional fluid management. So restrictive versus liberal fluid therapy for major. So this is a relief trial, but uh, on the restrictive versus liberal arm, again, they have given, even the restrictive arm has had a lot of fluid. So, and this is again being re-evaluated regarding this uh, restrictive versus, obviously they have had the uh, in-hospital stay had been shorter with this restrictive fluid approach rather than with the liberal fluid approach, but the liberal fluid approach has had about six liters for the 24 hours. So that's a large amount, which we hardly encounter in our patients. So we have to, uh, look at these studies carefully. So, so basically, we what we have to give is a maintenance as well as the volume. Losses. So, if there is a maintenance that we have to maintain, if there is a deficit, actually, of course, you have to do the fluid resuscitation with some fluid boluses. Some fluid boluses so, the fluid incorrect. process actually that's an individualized fluid bolus that not the, than, all the, not all the time. Not all the time. It? Yes, not all the time. Not that they should be fluid tolerable also. Yes. They should be fluid tolerable and they should have a requirement for fluids also. So, not so, that we should be giving blindly to all the patients a fixed amount. It should be individualized. And, and we have to assess, assess the, the patient yes. with the fluid responsiveness. Then you can go with the mini boluses, like 200 mils. The boluses can be given, right? So, again, uh, ERAS also says, ERAS always advocates goal directed fluid therapy. So, but ERAS uh, has been mostly focusing on elective surgeries rather than emergency ones, but they have, we are, there are some steps that we can uh, take on to our em emergency laparotomies as well, mostly as like counselings, and then we can take over uh, the tubes, we can try to take over the drain tubes, NG tubes early, and then early feeding, these sort of things, if possible, if can be adopted from ERAS, maybe uh, minimize opioid requirements, that sort of things can be adopted, and uh, the fluid management and the goal directed therapy can also be taken up. So maintenance therapy we have discussed, so the basal crystalloids and stuff. So the perioperative targets, the normothermia of temperature more than 36. So hypothermic sequelae such as coagulopathy and wood infection can be prevented. So temperature and neuromuscular monitoring are important. So I think we have discussed the discussed lung uh, protective ventilation, lung ventilation, protective lung ventilation. So the prevention of the uh, so, prevention of the arts. So the duration, I think duration is matters around the now because uh, this operative, if there is increased operative time, actually, so the adverse effects will be there. So like hypothermia, perioperative uh, hypotension, so that invariably go for organ hyperperfusion, electrolyte dis uh, disturbances. So the prolonged tissue handling by the surgeon, so that invariably will go for uh, uh, the coagulation effects and the blood loss as well. So it is recommended actually to go for a, uh, if not to go beyond 130 minutes. So that is what is a concept of uh, damage control surgery. So if your surgeon is going beyond this time, so all the anesthetists as us, as anesthetists, we have to be armed. So ask them to be quick. Right. Okay. So what else? So what we did in the post-operative, now we had the surgery, the patient is uh, the post-operatively, we have to take our lady into the ICU again for her post-operative resuscitation in giving her a good care actually post-op period and we have uh, the according to this uh, study is actually the NELA study audit as well as this possum they have the high risk so that she has to go for a ICU actually so we didn't extubate her post-op immediately so she was extubated to be extubated later on in the ICU so her noradrenaline support has gone up and we have to add vasopressin because uh, she has gone into septic uh, state and because of the stress handling during surgery and stress and everything has contributed her to have a more requirement on cardiovascular support in drugs so however we were able to maintain her map so we had this uh, ibp as well so we started hydrocortisone infusion 200 per day infusion because of we adding two inotropes uh, hemoglobin maintained as such with eight with the recommendations of the cardiologist. So we quite done the FIS, FIS uh, IVC collapsibility and now we were able to do the rapid leg bracing test to her to her assess her uh, the fluid responsiveness because now she's not in pain actually she's with a tube. So it was she was removed by the cardiologist as well. 
So the respiratory device, as we discussed, so she had a lung protective ventilation. On top of that, we were given a physiotherapy and quite frequent nebulizations, with, including neck as well. So the morph, we have to sedate her with propofol and morphine. It's ideal, as I said, if we have the morphine and remifentanil. Uh, the, some would suggest that it can go with uh, fentanyl as well, Ravindi, but unfortunate, it's not unfortunate actually, it's a physician's decision. So if I'm like, I'm happy to go with the morphine, that we thought of morphine would be fine rather than going with the fentanyl. There is no hard and fast rule to with your choice of uh, sedation agent. And the renal wise, so she was quite hydrated and maintaining urine output, so she quite uh, hydration maintained with the fluid maintenance and the fluid balances according to the fluid responsiveness. So we uh, avoid the nephrotoxic drugs, preferably, even though we have to continue the meropenem. So in nutrition and GIT wise, we encountered her the uh, enteral feeding uh, quite early, prophylaxis, soft ulcer prophylaxis, prokinetics was used. And she had a diet plan by the nutritionist and we established her on 30 kilocalories per day diet but we started with 15 kilocalories per day, and then we go on increment up to 20, 25, then ultimately came into 30, with the concept of this refeeding would be high because she was derived with uh, some uh, intake for the last couple of days, actually. So in that case, uh, then we added uh, some micro elements and the vitamins as well in this lady. So the DVT prophylaxis was given, not tenoxaparin because coagulation derange, but uh, the mechanical uh, devices was used. Physiotherapy established and bed source was assessed and then the repositioning, AR matrices, all, all sort of supportive care was given. So this is a multidisciplinary approach, as I said. So the involvement of microbiologists, cardiologists, physiotherapists, nutritionists, and all the nursing officers, radiologists, consultant radiologists involvement. So, so at the end, the success is led by the multidisciplinary involvement. This is not a one-person drama, actually. This is a not a one person, one actor is there. There are many more actors and everybody is implemented. So it's a teamwork. So that's why at the end, uh, you are leading to success. So coming back to our patient, so we did the repeat ultrasound on this lady. So she was some quite uh, collection asked there. So the radiologist decided that she has to have a PCN, percutaneous nephrostomy, which was placed after two days of the surgery, which was ultrasound guided. And now her kidney is coming better. The creatinine has gone down. So we were able to go for the repeat CT, contrast CT actually of the abdomen. So which was found that there was some collection, uh, but it is resolving collection compared to the previous one and extending towards the uh, psoas muscle. So this is the CT that we did actually, that you can see the collections are coming down. There you can see the collection, this thing. So this is the uh, CT of the lady. So I'm sorry about the, if it is good view, right, okay. So the collections are there on the, the left side, but it is coming down and, and extended to the psoas muscle actually. So, uh, but it is improving accordingly. So this is the, the chart that we had, uh, the, the, the summary chart that we had in this lady, that you can see the improving parameters on this patient. So we were able to gradually wean off this lady from the ventilator and we were able to tail it off her inotropic support. And quite nicely, we extubated on the day six and put on her CPAP. Then we was given some oxygen support, some with face mask. And, uh, but for, because she's elderly and multiple problems and quite long journey she had so far coming to the ICU. So she had a critical illness myopathy and a delirium was evident on this lady. So, however, we were able to step down her into the level two HDU care, and we discharged our lady in day 10 post-op in ICU, and we revived her in the 24 hours after. So, having said that, now we have given as anesthetics, intraoperative, so we have taken her into the ICU, we have quite resuscitated before going for the surgery, intraoperative, we have given the care, and coming back into the ICU in the post-op resuscitation phase, so we have resuscitated our lady. So would we have done anything in our ICU? So what do you think? Why ICU? I mean, what is the importance of having this patient in the ICU? She might need continuous optimization following this resuscitative laparotomy and then might need organ support depending on the patient's requirement. And then these patients are likely to have 
post-op complications. They can have a worsening of their AKI and then they can have pulmonary complications. This lady is likely to have cardiac complications. So for early recognition and management of these complications, it is necessary to have the patient in an ICU. And then Nella suggests that all patients with a predicted mortality of more than 10% end up in ICU. But the emergency laparotomy collaborative group suggests that all patients who are undergoing emergency laparotomy should but end we up we can't have that. We yes. can't have all our patients coming into the ICU post-operative. But that's why we have to have the risk stratification preoperatively and assess. And then we have to decide whom to go. Yes, exactly. Depends on. So the post-op resuscitation, and they have to decide on when to extubate the patient. So this will prevent on the period of post-operative ventilation that the patient required, then oxygen requirement, the acid-based status, and the metabolic parameters should be normalized. And then vasopressor requirements should be minimal. The temperature should be normothermic. The nutrition should be assessed to and managed. And the glycemic control optimized and the antiemetics on board. So this is the time to extubate the patient. So analgesia. Uh, analgesia is a very important aspect in any post-op patient. So uh, without appropriate analgesia, we all know that organ-specific complications such as uh, cardiac events, pulmonary events, and the impaired mobilization leading to deep pain thrombosis, all of these uh, are going to be more. And then uh, pain is an un unpleasant sensation. The patient is going to be in distress. So uh, what are our goals? Yeah, that's right. There are some issues around this. I think uh, be giving opioids, there are uh, the issues are there. So opioids that it can cause cognitive dysfunction and can have the respiratory dispression. That's most of the the post-operative patients who are going into the wards. That's why they are not uh, they are not very reluctant to give the opioids actually. So the gastrointestinal dysfunction and post-operative nausea and vomiting. But there are good signs as well. As well. Yes. I mean, they'll be able to breathe well, cough well, they'll be move, able to move around and then they'll be able to walk quickly. So these are all positive aspects of appropriate analgesia. So uh, we should focus on having a opi minimal opioid consumption analgesia. So, but you have to balance with the patients. With the patients. So, risk and the benefits. Exactly. I mean, this patient cannot have a central neuraxial analgesia yeah, if that's possible. Why, yeah, this is a high-risk patient, has had us, because uh, she's a coagulated, coagulation deranged patient as well as she's an emergency patient who's coming for the laparotomy. So we were not able to go for the epidural or a uh, spinal for her. So the, the options that we have, we can go for a tap block and Alternative, we can go for the yes. rectus sheet block. And we can have catheters in place for continuous Definitely, infusions, yes. IV lignocaine, sublingual ketamine can be used. But uh, PCA, while when we are coming down, a PCA is a nice good option if we can afford to. If we have a PCA pump, we can let the patient control their own analgesia yes. so that they'd be more comfortable with it. Yeah, then, then you can have the morphine or you can have uh, wherever fentanyl or whatever oxycodone or whatever that depends. depending on the patient yes, and the clinician's preference so gabapentin of course the adverse effects of drowsiness can come about but uh, they've used a very small dose yeah they use not... a very small dose of gabapentin in this patient even though it's acute pain management uh, or the neuropathic pain that they use commonly but we used gabapentin 100 uh, bd and then we have encountered it at tds dose and we avoid the nsaids because of the coagulation in the issues. emergency setup yes. most of the time we cannot use in NSAIDs, but it's a good somatic analysis for all other conditions, but maybe not for the renally impaired and the ac acutely ill patients. So enhanced recovery after surgery, again, we thought of what we could uh, adopt it from enhanced recovery pathways into our emergency laparotomies. There are limited options, but we can, as we discussed before, we can adopt some of those changes, like hypothermia can be prevented, pain can be addressed with minimum opioids, and then... Uh, Prolonged fasting can be avoided and early enteral feeding can be encouraged. All the tubes can come out soon. And uh, these are well adopted in the elective setting than in the emergency setting. So it's just a brief uh, outline of what the ERAS would recommend for preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care pathways for a Even elective. Even though this is for elective, we can we encounter can this is in our uh, the emergency laparotomies as well. Yes. So... So, yeah, so that's saving lives in the emergency laparotomy. So this is uh, basically the protocol approach that we have to have. That's why we say that uh, you have to screen the patients early as possible. So that's why you have to have the MUSE or whatever the scores, MUSE nurse or whatever the scores that is using in the, the screening the patient. So you have to assess the patient, whether the sepsis patient is going, so you have to assess and treat up, uh, promptly as such. 
by, for example, giving antibiotics within the first hour is very important. So it's a decision to operation has to be made, as we said, right time, right surgery, right person has to be right. implemented. So that's why we said the consultants, the most senior persons has to be involved in the management of this patient as well as the anesthesiologist. So if you have the cardiac assessment or the invasive assessment, well, of course you can have the, uh, the invasive monitoring to assess the patient's hemodynamic status of the patients. And depending on the risk that you have to have the patient coming for the ICU, not all, but the patients has to come for the ICU. Right. So as perioperative care, as a role of anesthetist, when we are giving the perioperative care, so this is the case that we did actually. So we have given the perioperative care, preoperative, intraoperative, as well as postoperative. Uh, the optimization, even though it's a resuscitation with a limited time period. It's not only us giving the, during the surgery, we are giving anesthesia or making the patient sleep or numb during the anesthesia. But we, as perioperative physicians, we do care in the patients pre-op as well as post-op periods as well. So, so that's our, as anesthetists, what we do, it's not only in the theater, that the holistic care of the patient. So thank you very much for listening for our case that we have a, the real case actually, how we did and how we did manage and luckily the patient was recovered. Thank you very much. So this is our reference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harini and Dr. Ravindi for that excellent um, interactive uh, presentation that addressed uh, the subject in depth, uh, actually keeping with the, uh, the years, the theme of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, which is the professional excellence towards holistic healthcare. So we actually uh, pay, paid a lot of attention it, during this year. Uh, for uh, the, I mean, the teamwork, the holistic care that need to be arranged for people. I mean, say be, me being a physician that uh, I so much appreciate the need to establish holistic healthcare for our stroke patients. So now I realize that how important it is for you in your field as well. The, uh, this is the time for you to uh, 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 ask, uh, I mean, the questions from the panel. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the participants online. Uh, how about using individual fluid management, using ultrasound, IVC, perioc, echo? I think uh, you have to go there because that's too much. I think, madam, we have discussed, that's what we were telling about the individualized uh, patient management using IVC collapsibility and focused intensive care echo, that we see the volume status of the patient with the echo probe to see the, uh, the ventricular collapsibility, the presence of kissing ventricles as such that we go. So uh, the, those dynamic parameters uh, that we have to use, that I think we have discussed throughout that fluid management, we were telling that that is the importance of uh, having those uh, parameters, the assessment with as such when we are assessing the patients, but it has also be, be, be individualized as well. Uh, the next question is from me actually now for this patient at 70 years of age with the ejection fraction of about 30. Okay. And uh, uh, you made me a little anxious when you, I mean, I say we all the time would see that this patient would need even an anticoagulant to avoid thromboembolism. So you had to stop even antiplatelets. So was there a place at the initial stage itself to start on uh, enoxaparin or uh, heparin? Uh, the, uh, you mean the bridging therapy, madam? Yes. Yeah. The, now this one is uh, the dual platelets. So that's why I think the importance of having uh, the multidisciplinary approach, that's why we had a discussion with the cardiologist. So the V anesthetist as well as the surgeon, we had open chat actually regarding this patient. So then we decided uh, now we have to take that risk. Anyhow, she has to go for the emergency laparotomy. We know that there's a risk of bleeding. So that's, and they are, if you are stopping this uh, antiplatelet, there can be a risk of uh, the coagulation, the, the thrombosis as well. So in, in that's why we uh, thought of uh, omitting the clopid and uh, continuation of aspirins to weighing the risk and the balance, madam. And the same time, the enoxaparin, 
Now, initially her coagulation is also deranged a little bit. So, uh, because INR was around hitting around more than 1.5, then we thought of no need of going for enoxaparin as such, even though there is a risk. So that's why we didn't continue her enoxaparin with, with the risk of uh, coagulation. Uh, with, she didn't have stent actually. So if the stent, then we would have been uh, go with the clopid even actually. Uh, so th there is a risk of bleeding and the, uh, the coagulation, but we thought not to give enoxaparin as such. The cardiologist uh, advised to omit uh, clopidogrel and continue with the aspirin. So that's why we have to have a discussion with the multidisciplinary as well as the approach with the patient's family. So however, we were able to convince them, however, we have to go with the surgery. So luckily we had the right surgery at the right time, which has saved the patient. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Another important point I think that you highlighted was now these patients, they have this uh, the, the uh, component that is uh, contributed by frailty uh, because that their multi organs are affected and the need for geriatric definitely, uh, yeah. geriatrician. And uh, even once you have uh, uh, recovered the patient, once the patient has been discharged from the intensive care unit, even once they have come to the ward, it's so difficult for them to get back home and they take so long for a recovery and they need even another intermediate center uh, before uh, being discharged home. So I think that the need of a geriatrician was highlighted by your presentation and also the physiotherapist. So they need so much of care. So much of care after discharging patient to the ward, actually, madam. So if, even though we discharge the patient for some extent of uh, optimizing their uh, parameters and the physiology, so after going to ward, if they don't have the physiotherapy, if they don't do the, this uh, breathing exercises, if they don't mobilize, so they invariably coming back to square one. So coming back to the previous state. So that is important for us to continuity of care, to give this continuity of care. So I think uh, any other questions from the audience? But so in the absence of questions, uh, uh, let me thank the three panelists uh, who made so much of uh, valuable, uh, the very much practical, I mean, for practical for Sri Lankan sitting, uh, the management of this, uh, the uh, perioperative, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, perioperative care pathways, ensuring patient safety and improved outcomes. I mean, uh, the presentation was around that topic. So uh, let me thank them, join with me to thank them in the uh, usually accepted manner and also for me to present them with the uh, note of appreciation awarded by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, LMA and my dear colleagues, on behalf of the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensivists of Sri Lanka, first of all, I would like to thank the president and the SLMA for giving us this opportunity to, to highlight our role in perioperative care. And uh, dear Vihara, uh, Harini, and Ravindri, thanks for representing the college. And in a nice manner, you have shown the importance of our role in perioperative care. And dear participants, thank you for your participation. And finally, I would like to thank the Technomedics for their contribution for refreshment. And on behalf of the college, I would like to invite you all to <laughs> enjoy that refreshment with us. Thanks again. Thank you and, very much. And let me thank very much the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensivists of Sri Lanka for joining with Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, to make this uh, session so much of a success. And there is another uh, one of our council members, Dr. Achala Balasuriya, who liaises with you and took an interest in organizing that. I'm uh, very thankful to Achala as well. Thank you so much. And communicate our appreciations to your president. Thank you so much. Thank you.